Ladies and gents, my name is Matt Locke and you're listening to, and perhaps watching, the Unleashing Potential podcast. It's in these episodes that I chat with a range of progressive individuals who are unleashing their potential on the world around them at work and in life. With that said, I'm glad you're here so you can join me as we take a deep dive with today's guest. Felicity, welcome to the Everyday Athlete podcast. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. Not at all. And uh, today we're going to talk all about your journey as a professional athlete that led you to winning two gold medals at the Olympics and you were a two times world record holder, I believe. Yeah, actually uh, three individual world records, but um, sorry to correct you already, like we're only a minute, I've already got you. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, three individual world records in short course, so the 25 metres swimming pool. Yeah, what, what an amazing history. I think uh, if we just kick off, if you could just take a couple of minutes just to talk us through who you are, um, what you do, where you're from, and then we'll dive into, no pun intended, um, your swimming career. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I mean, now um, I'm Felicity Lemke, uh, married for now 10 years. Uh, but when I was swimming, I was Felicity Galvez. Uh, and the gym that I own now is Galvanised Fitness. And a pun on my uh, swimming maiden surname, so Galvez. Um, and yeah, I was a professional athlete as a swimmer for 10 years. Went to two Olympic Games, 2004 Athens and 2008. Beijing. Um, Beijing was where I came away with two super gold medals and I've got them here. So ah, let's have a look at them. I know you were you were a little reluctant in fairness to get them, but, but we want to see them because they're awesome and you worked hard for them. They're, they're spectacular. Yeah, so they're, that's them there. So both um, both in relays and as a heat swimmer. So it was one of these, um, and if you don't mind me going into it, so one of these kind of special moments where Australia was the only country at that Olympics in the swimming uh, space that decided to take um, eight swimmers for the four by two and the four by one medley relay. So they swam a fresh four in, at, at the heats and a fresh four in the finals. Now the reason they did that was because for the first time ever they swapped the heats and the finals times around. So they had the heats in the night and the finals in the mornings. So total shift on what we were used to doing and our, what our bodies were used to doing and getting ready for, you know, everybody trains better at night time. If you're going to go and do heavy lifts, you're probably going to do them more, much better at night than you would in the morning. And the same thing goes for, you know, um, racing as an athlete. So we, Australians to me thought, well, the best way to do this was to have fresh athletes for our heats so that we could qualify through as one of the favourites to go into the finals because it was it was tough. Like, you know, everyone's there with their best swimmers on the day. So um, I was part of the, the heat swimmers for both the four by one medley relay and the four by two freestyle relay where we, you know, came away with the win. And obviously heat swimmers are, are valued just as much as the final swimmers. And we got those gold medals as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's in incredibly cool. And um, I, I'm fortunate enough to have had the, the backstory before now, uh, when we've caught up, and um, yeah, I look forward to sharing that. But yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, congratulations to all of you. It's an amazing achievement. Yeah, thank uh, you. And I guess by diving straight to the Olympics and the gold medals, it overlooks a huge amount of work and training. And, and I guess um, that must have been your life for many, many years to get to that point. It doesn't happen by accident. No, absolutely not. It, that was my job. Um, I had a little gig on the side, just working at the AIS where I was swimming, just to kind of make a bit of money on the side as well. But, you know, it was um, two hours in the pool in the morning, two hours in the pool at night. And then in between that, we had an hour, an hour and a half of weights. And then you're trying to get your massage and physiotherapy done, eating, because you can eat a huge amount of <laughs> food as an athlete, and then just trying to rest so that you can then prepare yourself for that afternoon session again. Um, pretty intense, yeah. Absolutely. How many days a week would that be your regime? Uh, so trained every day, Monday through to Friday, and then we did big sessions on Saturday morning. So we had Sundays off. L literally off or active recovery? No, everything. Oh, you didn't have to do anything. So Lying on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's, a heavy, that's a heavy load. I mean, do you, just out of interest, not to dive into the details too much, but Adam, what, what kind of, kind of caloric, caloric intake were you consuming? Then? Like, what would you have to eat? You know, I, I don't know, I was one of those lucky people and I guess I still am now where I can eat whatever I want and I don't really have to watch my intake and yeah. out of um, calories. I, don't, I didn't never watch calories and I still don't watch calories. Um, 
to the point where I was probably uh, one of those athletes that had to make sure I was eating enough to keep the weight on. Um, so, you know, I'd be doing threshold sets in the pool and then my coach would get me out. He'd tell me to smash down like a power bar or something like that and, and a fruit tub and then keep swimming just because I would just lose, lose weight. Like before um, Beijing Olympics, I was uh, 58 kilos and they, you know, my coach said if I dropped underneath that, he wasn't going to let me go. Um, so I just had to work really hard on eating lots of food to, to try and maintain that 58 plus um, weight category otherwise not that you know it mattered when you're swimming but you can be too lean and with a sport where everything's about being buoyant you want a little bit of fat I guess on your body to be able to help with that buoyancy so yeah it was something I had to think about just eating not worrying about what I was eating yeah no absolutely and you're right you are lucky in that regard isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all good the um so I mean obviously a massive training load but, but as you say it was your job that's what you did full time um, yeah. And I'm guessing that um, you obviously had loads of endorsement um, and a great salary from um, all of the uh, the programs that the government would run and so on. Or was it actually a little bit harder than that? Was it making ends meet where possible and kind of limping along? Yeah, look, swimming, unless you were the Ian Thorpes and the Grant Hackett's and the Lisa Joneses, it, you know, it just didn't really, sponsorship wasn't a big thing um, for the other, you know, 40 swimmers on the team every year. Um, I was lucky in the fact that I had a scholarship at the AIS, so they supported us. Um, they gave me, gave us a certain amount of money every year to help with either rent or you could live on site and then everything was kind of uh, looked after for you. Um, but as for making really good money and retiring and living on, on heaps, not so much for me anyway. Um, but, you know, I would always enter myself in some of the, the meets that you could go over and win, win great prize money. Um, just to be able to pocket some of that and put it away as savings. So um, not a sport that I would tell people, if you want to make a lot of money, go and do it. Um, maybe do tennis or golf or something more amazing. Um, but yeah, for swimming, swimming for me wasn't, wasn't about making money. And, and I never started it because of that. I did it because I loved it. Um, so walking away with a little bit in my back pocket was, was enough because winning those medals and all the memories and the world records that I broke was, was enough. Well, priceless, in fact. Um, yeah, literally priceless. But uh, I think most sports are that way. There's very few sports. It's really only the, the very, very pointy end of the stick that are earning yeah. you know, major money. Um, I, I guess soccer, football, probably. Yeah, yeah. Breaks the mould there. But no, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, most sports are that way inclined. And um, you knew that going into it, so money was never your motivation, right? No, not at all, yeah. No, for sure. So um, was it very much a solo endeavour or...? Was there, I mean, obviously you, you won the medals as part of t a team, um, but you also had world records as a solo swimmer. So would you, would you describe the whole journey as a solo endeavour or was it a team, team effort? Um, it's kind of, it's, it's one of those funny ones. Like as a swimmer, you, you train in the squad. Um, you'd know that with your triathlon training. Like I'm sure a lot of the times with your swimming stuff, you, you're training with the squad. So you never really feel like you're on your own. Um, until you get to the point where you sit down with your coach and you go, all right, well, what, what are my goals for this year? What, what do I want to personally achieve? And then as a squad, you, you train and you do it all together. Um, but obviously, it's, the pressure is on you as an individual. If you want to make the Olympic team, you've got to qualify individually or, you know, do the best race you can individually that then hopefully qualifies you, not just for an individual event like I did for 2004 Olympics, but you know, then hopefully gurns you a spot for one of those relays because um, they're a pretty special thing to be part of. So it's one of those things that, yes, it's an individual sport because you get to train as a squad and you, you're doing that training together um, and then you go away as a team. It almost doesn't feel like it's an individual sport, but at the end of the day, you stand behind those blocks and no one else has got you back other than yourself. So sure. <laughs> you definitely do feel like it is is it, it is an individual sport when you're standing there. <laughs> yeah, that must be a, an incredible, if not surreal moment, I can imagine. But um, yeah. so talk us through the qualification process, because certainly when we chatted about it before, it sounds really quite unforgiving. Like yeah. You have to bring your best game to that particular moment on that day. But yeah, talk us through how that works. Yeah, well, every, every year we have Australian titles. So our trials for whatever meet it is for that year. So... Um, whether it's an Olympic year, we have that. We usually used to have it in April, 
Um, and then obviously August is when Olympics normally land. And then same thing every other year, whether there was World Championships or Commonwealth Games or Pampax, um, there was always one Olympic trial, or one trials for it. Um, so with my events, I used to assume the 50, 100 and 200 butterfly, sometimes throwing the 100 freestyle and 200 freestyle. Each of those at the long course meets would be a heat swim in the morning, back up in the afternoon or night and do a semi-final. And then the top eight swimmers go through to the final the next night. But then that next day, you may have another event. So you may have another heat swim of some other event. And then you may have a semi-final and the final of another event on the same night. So you could be backing up two to three times. And then if you're swimming in a relay because you're part of a club, um, you could have up to three to four swims each each night as well. So, but you know, if you go into that meet and a lot of athletes would would know the whole um, taper sickness. So you, you train really, really hard and you put everything on the line and then you start tapering and you build down the kilometers or whatever, you know, your, your strength work, or whatever you're doing in your specific sport. And then you, you get to the point where you've got, you know, minimal training in that week before your, your race meet and your body can just go into a bit of a, into a bit of a hole and, like there's a thing that's called, you know, taper sickness. And that's that really fine line of just making sure that you're resting enough. You're, you're eating the right stuff. You're having all your supplements so that you're keeping your body healthy, um, but not, not getting sick because we literally had one shot at it. And if you are sick, that's just unlucky. Um, you could have had the best prep and it doesn't matter. So yeah, it's, it's brutal, tough. isn't it? It's brutal. Yeah. But it is the same for everyone. So I guess it is what it is. But nonetheless. Well, and look at, at the Olympics and World Championships. It's not like they go, oh, look, we'll throw another meet on because Felicity was sick. Like you have one shot and that's, that's it, you know. And it's probably the best way to do it as hard as, hard as, as it is. Um, it's, it's no better way to prepare for something than doing it how it's going to be on, in real life, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, talk us through... I mean, the first time you went to the Olympics, you were extra because it, it's something that the majority of athletes in the world will never do, whatever sport they're in. Uh, mm. Was it as awesome as we'd like to imagine? Was it as blinged up and as amazing as you would have hoped? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's many opportunities where so many amazing athletes from all different sports and all different countries around the world can all come together into one place at the one time and all have their eyes set on the same prize, like those elusive gold, silver and bronze medals. Um, and there's only a handful of them to be, you know, handed out to so many athletes. Um, you know, to be able to sit down at these epically long dining tables in the food hall and sit with, you know, Roger Federer and Nadal and, you know, like amazing people and you're just sitting there eating because that's what you do. Um, and then, you know, just walking around the village and you see, you know, these basketballs are just these gigantic people, um, all different shapes and sizes and, you know, you've got little gymnasts that are amazing in what they do. And then you look next to them and they've got this, you know, Chinese basketballer and he'd like triple, triple the size of these gymnasts. And it's, it's just amazing to see you've got your weightlifters and they're so big. Um, just to, to be all in that one space at the one time was pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you get starstruck at all? Did you get to meet any of your uh, heroes? Oh, look, I, I love tennis. I think I've said tennis about five times since we spoke. So, um, like when, yeah, like when Nadal and Roger Federer are there and, you know, we're literally sitting having dinner at the same table. It's, it's cool. Like you don't, you don't really say anything. Oh, I didn't. You're just too scared. But um, you just ask for the salt to be passed down. Or, Maybe they were having the same thought about you and, and your mate. Mm, maybe not. <laughs> 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 um, but no, like, yeah, there's, there's times where you're like, wow, that's so-and-so and you just all like pretend to look away and not, um, not, notice them because you don't really want to make that eye contact because it is scary. <laughs> yeah, sure. And um, yeah, of course, then I guess it comes to the big day um, when, when you have to actually compete. Um, is that like a, a regular day in terms of the, I guess, the routine that you would go through um, in terms of eating, warm up and so on? Or was it all a bit special? Um, it, it is a little bit different. We, we do, when I was swimming, we did try to replicate 
events and races so that we got your body gets used to that whole routine of this is when we have to get up this is what we need to do pre warm up then we go and eat and have to eat a certain time before racing so that you, you know you don't feel too sick and then there's the whole travel to the pool do your warm up at the pool get your race suit on because that's like a whole event in itself um, which we've spoken about before. I think we've got a video that we're going to share later. So. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like it just—it was just part of making it as normal as possible, okay. so that when it becomes race day, you've got enough nerves, you've got enough um, un uncertainty going on with um, racing people you've never raced, and you know, possibly missing the bus because they're, they're full and you have to wait for the next one and maybe being late to your warm-up. And you, you almost have to go in with a really um, whatever happens, happens attitude. If you go in with an attitude like that, you're going to deal with it the best way you can because so much of it is unpredictable. Um, you know, a suit ripping, that was just part of what happened. So you take three into the change room, be ready for two to break and hope that that third one doesn't so that you're ready to go out and race so yeah. it's just it's just another thing it's it's weird yeah yeah actually speaking of the suits we had some fun you um you hosted us we stayed at your home uh, yeah. with uh, your family oh, a couple of months ago and you were um because ned wanted to see them all you were kind enough to get them out and were showing us how they worked and i mean the the, the technology that goes into those is incredible isn't it yeah absolutely and yours were even um, a special order from, where were they coming from? Japan. Japan. Yeah. yeah, even a special I, order. I was um, 10 to 12 kilos lighter than what I am now. And um, just the, the swimming suits that were made by Speedo in Australia just weren't small enough to fit the, my frame. So I had to order special size ones from Japan to bring them out for me and a couple of other girls um, on the team just because you need them to be as tight as anything to be able to hold everything in so that you didn't have any drag, so that when you dived in, you know, there wasn't big bubbles. And this photo that I feel like you're going to share with everyone, I'm kind of like holding my chest. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that everybody knows, it's so that, you know, what you do is you, walk, you grab water and you push it all onto your body and then you flatten out the suit so that when you dive in, there's no uh, gap between, I guess, your body and the suit kind of sticks to it and then it doesn't let that the air bubbles go in the suit which makes it you know one drag and then super uncomfortable and the last thing you need to feel is a bubble floating around in your in your belly when you're swimming so yeah no sure enough well i wasn't going to use that photo but now that you've said it i'm going now. to <laughs> and i'm pretty sure when i said it to you earlier and asked what you were doing your comment was that um, that's what profession that's how professional athletes warm up and that's why i wouldn't know that um, yeah, that's I believe your second comment was, I was warming my chest up for a gold medal, which <laughs> was perfect. Everyone's like, oh, she's cocky. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, maybe it was your second. You'd already got the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, that, that was super incredible. And we, we, when we were at your house, you sort of did the whole pour water onto it whilst holding your hand. And it was just crazy. It's like it, yeah. it, it repelled the water even before it came to contact with it. It looked like yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Incredible, yeah, but, yeah, amazing technology. So, um, in the interest of time, and I'm conscious of uh, of your time, um, was it euphoric that moment when you realised that that you you got your first gold, you were part of the team, and you'd got the first gold? Was that how, how was that moment? I and mean, it's incredible, huh? Do you know, it's funny. I just got invited to um, Queensland, and we obviously because the girls, the, the Olympics was meant to happen this year, so they invited the 4x2 freestyle relay girls to Queensland because they had a staging camp for the prospective 4x2 freestyle relay girls for this year. Now it's next year. Um, as, as almost like a mentorship program for them to, to talk to us and delve into how, how we dealt with it and what we felt and how we prepared and, you know, what were, what were the kind of things thrown in to, to make it difficult. Um, and we, you know, we touched on this and it hasn't, it hasn't been for, what are we, you know, years since I've spoken about how it felt or, or really dove into it since I, I guess I retired. Um, and I, I don't feel like I was super happy for myself. It was more those four girls, because you know that feeling of when you're behind the blocks and you're doing it not just for yourself, but for the four other girls in the heats. And that was myself and the three other girls. Um, 
you just want to produce the best swim you possibly can because it isn't just about you. It's about those three other girls. And then for us, it was the three other girls in our heat and then the four other girls that were hopefully going to qualify for that final. Um, so for me, you know, we did our job. We qualified those girls for the final. And then when they touched the wall and, and that four by two, like we won and we weren't meant to. We were the underdogs. We were in lane seven. They they thought America was going to take it out. And they should have. Um, but we just put four exceptional swims together on the day and, and did it. Um, but for me, it was just knowing what those girls have felt for the past eight minutes or just under. Um, knowing that they touched the wall and they won. And, you know, they broke a world record at the same time. <laughs> with just that elation of knowing that that they've done it and um yes we helped them get there but it was just that sense of relief that, that that's what they did and and knowing that feeling that they would be feeling i actually felt that but it wasn't like yes i got the medal it was more that we did it like we did yeah. it as a team and we've we've represented our country in the best way possible absolutely as you say taking out a world record at the same time yeah. <laughs> pretty classy just pretty <laughs> You know, that, that's spectacular. What an absolutely uh, um, amazing journey. Um, and I guess just to touch on very briefly, when you, I guess the Olympics, as we now know, have been shifted to next year, to 2021 on the back of uh, COVID-19. Um, mm. Can you imagine how that must, the impact of that, how it must feel for all of the athletes affected by that necessary decision? Look, I, I have talked about this a little bit because I've had a few people ask me that same question. And I think, and I think it's, it's affected everyone. So, you know, we're all in the same boat. It's not like it's unfair for some countries and fair for others. So I think there's a certain period of time, and this happened for me, as, as I'm sure it's happened for everybody else in the last few weeks. We've gone through a huge change in our lives. Um, I had a day where I had a massive meltdown and... I cried and I lost it. And then I gathered everything together, put all my shit together, because I think you said I was allowed to. You're allowed to, it. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just thought, well, you know what? There's no point whinging and moaning about it. Just get on with it and make the best you can of it. You know what? If you were going into trials, which they were going to go into in the next few months, and you hadn't had the best prep, well, then you've just won yourself another year of prep. Great. If yep. you're going in with the best prep, you just go, well, I'm in the best shape I'm in now. Just maintain it. And that's not hard to do. It's just about resetting those goals. And, you know, I've had to readjust my whole business model with my gym. And I'm now discovering, thanks to you helping me with Zoom, I'm now discovering that, you know, I'm, I'm now pushing myself out of my comfort zone and my clients are loving it. And I'm like secretly loving it too. It's kind of special. I still get to sit down and have dinner with my family because I'm zooming from my garage and I finish that and I come up and I have dinner. There are, there are little um, highlights and, you know, little golden nuggets that come out of this. And I think it's the attitude that you take and the positive way you look at stuff is, is what is going to make, make or break you at the end of the day. So everyone's Olympics has been postponed. It's not just Australia. It's not just that individual athlete. Everyone is in the same boat. So you just got to go, righto, we're all in this together see what you can do ships in the night you know like whilst other people might be you know whinging and moaning about it be one of the ships in the night that just keep moving and then you just take take over i, I just think it's an opportunity more than anything yeah absolutely um i was chatting with uh, alethea earlier as you know and um we came to the conclusion i, I referenced um, mike riley one of the iron man announcers who basically said uh, on race day in, the, in his case um, he's, he always briefs athletes. He said, there's only one thing you can control and that's your attitude. Mm. Um, so be nice to everyone, stay positive and know that you have got control of your attitude if nothing else. Um, and I think that's applicable here because um, there's so much uncertainty around the whole COVID-19 topic. However, there are things absolutely in our control um, and the more we focus on those uh, and take control of them, the better off we'll be. But, um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Very good. So Felicity, um, if anyone wanted to reach out and get in touch with you, what would be the best way that they could do that? Uh, well, if they wanted to get in touch with me, they can look up Instagram. So Swim Fit Chick is me. And then there's also Galvanised Fitness um, on Instagram as well. Otherwise, search websites. Um, Galvanised Fitness is my gym website as well. Absolutely. And you have a Wikipedia page as well. Mm -hmm. Don't you? Yes. <laughs> 
You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, 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 put all, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll put all of those links and so on down in the, uh, the show notes as well. But uh, Felicity, thank well, you so much for your time. Always a pleasure, you know that. And um, look forward to speaking to you uh, at the, in the next episode. Awesome. Thank you.